Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Sarah Nord Calvary Baptist Church. We want to uh, welcome everyone and uh, we um, look forward to having a good night of fellowship and study of God's word here uh, tonight. We're going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer before we begin. Let's pray. Hey, Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for bringing us uh, thus far, Lord. You know, we can count on you to uh, take us out, Lord, to where we need to go and bring us back in uh, uh, home safely, Lord. Uh, we, we know we only got here because of you, and we thank you. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as we go through your word here, as we go through this study, as we uh, come together with Reverend Chisholm, and uh, that you work through him so that um, we can uh, learn more about the word, learn how to apply it to our lives, learn how to share it with others, learn how to defend uh, the faith. So uh, we thank you, Lord, for the knowledge that he has, that you have given him, and that he is willing to share uh, with us. Uh, let it be clear and concise for us, Lord, and in whatever we don't understand that we can uh, ask so we can fully or more understand uh, what we are hearing. And we ask you to uh, bless those who are on their way, bless those who are here, and I uh, ask you to also um, be with those who will be listening um, on the uh, YouTube channel that they get the full understanding of what we are doing here tonight as well. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you have done and all you will continue to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, um, everybody here is, we have no, we're all uh, home folk, as they say. So we know that uh, this is being recorded for the uh, YouTube channel and um, you know, we ask you to always behave accordingly uh, for uh, the presentation. You know, you can mute your mics, but then if you have a question, you can just wave your hand and we'll acknowledge you or you can use the uh, raise hand icon and we will call on you. If you don't want to speak, uh, you can put it in the chat and we will uh, uh, acknowledge you from the uh, chat as well if you have any questions or statements or observations. And uh, everyone knows, as, as Reverend Chisholm was at on church on Sunday, that he does not mind being interrupted or questioned. So just um, give a little time so you can be acknowledged so you can go ahead and interrupt him. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Reverend Chisholm. Thank you, my brother. Good evening, brethren. Mm -hmm. Now, on the assumption that you all got the handout and took some time to read it, I'm not going to go through everything, certainly not the last part on prophecy, since we did an extensive series some months back. I'll take you through the bulk of it beyond that one. So it is why the Bible? What about the Bible sets it apart from other holy books like the Quran of the Muslims, the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus, the Zoroastrian texts, the Book of Mormon, and any religion that has a holy book? And as more than a book of human origin, thus a divinely authored book. What, why the Bible and what about the Bible sets it apart from every other holy book? Let me give you some introductory comments now. One, no one needs to take any religious holy book seriously because they may all be completely human in origin and so faulty and untrustworthy. Two, though possible, it is highly unlikely that anyone can do a comparative study of all religious holy books. There's one person I read about who says he did exactly that. And to that I said, Lord, I believe, help though my unbelief. <laughs> this is the astrophysicist um, Hugh Ross. He says he, he was an unsafe person and he decided to just check out the holy books, read all that he could find, maybe that is a qualifier, all that he could find and he read them. But the Bible struck him as being more in line with his scientific training than all of the other books that he read. Three, if you take seriously a particular religion that relies on a holy book for guidance of life and ideas, then you need evidence that convinces you and can persuade others that your holy book is trustworthy and is more than an ordinary human book. My main points now, when one is considering the trustworthiness of any document, especially an ancient one, there are two basic issues to be considered textual integrity and historical accuracy. With special reference to the Bible though, another has to be added, namely prophetic accuracy. It is important too, even in an overview fashion to consider if there is anything about the holy book that appears to be more than human or that can't be explained easily or at all if a mere human is behind the book's composition. 
few little pointers now. Textual integrity relates to the number and quality of the material on which we find the text. We call those manuscripts if there's a plurality of them, manuscript if there's only one copy. The date of events in the text in light of the date of the writing up of the document itself, plus date of earliest manuscripts, all very important if you're gonna check out the trustworthiness of an ancient document. Historical accuracy relates to the closeness of the content of the manuscript to what really was, so long as we are dealing with a text of history as opposed to one of poetry. So you wouldn't read a piece of poetry as if you're reading history. You have to make a distinction between the two kinds of literature, the two genres of literature. There are for me three more than human aspects of the Bible that deserve mention. These are its obsession with chronology, providing time or dating cues concerning key events, fulfilled prophecy, and elements of prescience. The word looks like prescience, it's pronounced prescience, but it really means prescience, providing scientific information which no one at the time of writing could have known. So first we look at prescience, biomedical prescience. I'm drawing material here from a book I recommend for those of you who are more studious than the others. John Wark Montgomery's edited book, Evidence for Faith, Deciding the God Question. All right, so 1.1, puzzling Old Testament health practices. In the study of microscopic organisms that cause diseases in animals and plants, having the right instrument is critical to research and discovery. And the basic instrument is the light microscope. This was invented only in the 17th century of this era. And even though early researchers saw fungi and bacteria, no links were made between these organisms and disease. Not until the 20th century, after the invention of X-ray technology, and the electron microscope, did humankind develop the technological base for understanding the relationship between microscopic organisms and disease, including how and by what means diseases are transmitted. In light of that historical re reality, there is something divinely suggestive, I put it no stronger, about certain commanded health practices in sections of the Old Testament, written about 1500 to 1400 BC, thousands of years before the basic microscope was invented. So let's look now at clean and unclean animals. And I would need somebody, you're not familiar, no doubt, with these passages. So I'm going to ask somebody to find Leviticus 11, 26, maybe not to 46, but 26 to 30, just to give us a cue. And then I'll go on. Leviticus 11, 26 to 30, about clean and unclean animals. Doesn't matter what version you have. Just find that text and read for us up to verse 30. Thanks. Leviticus eleven twenty six to 30. Right. All right, reading. The carcass of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, are unclean unto you. Everyone that touches them shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws, among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Whoso touches their carcass, uh, shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. They are unclean unto you. These, are, these also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind. Verse 30, and the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail and the mole. All right, thank you so much. So if people did not readily die after eating any animal that they found easily available and edible, why the need for a taboo on certain animals? A puzzle, unless there's more to it than meets the eye. Let's look at swine, available, tasty, but forbidden. They harbor several disease-producing microorganisms like tapeworm cysts, which are easily transmissible to humans especially in inadequately cooked pork. Now, please remember, we're not talking about the modern age with your fancy ovens that can get any temperature you want. We talk about 1500 BC, before they even knew anything about ovens or even anything apart from an open fire, maybe wood fire. Aquatic and marine animals without fins and scales, available, tasty, but forbidden. 
Almost all of the prohibited ones are scavengers or bottom feeders. They feed low in the food chain. Often found in relatively shallow waters, historically used for disposal of garbage and raw sewage. Historically, these animals have, animals have been linked with the spread of typhoid. Next category, rodents, rats, mice, etc. And by the way, rats and mice are not the same. They are not identical. They are different species. They are forbidden. They are natural reservoirs for some of the worst diseases known, transmitted by touch, by rodent bite, or via an insect that has bitten the rodent or is harbored by it. Compare bubonic plague, which wiped out a, a major part of the ancient world, rabies, virus, and tapeworms. Now we move to another category, health practices concerning dead bodies. Numbers 19, 11 to 22, Leviticus 11, 32 to 35. I'm not going to take the time out to read these passages. I think the health practices concerning dead bodies would be more familiar to most of us, or at least a goodly number of us. Know the issue of unclean till evening, or even in the old KJ version, which is evening, verses 7 to 8, 19, 21, as a suggestion of the need for washing plus exposure to sun as a health precaution. You should know if you don't that the sun has uh, antibacterial properties, the sunlight. And clothes are better dealt with in terms of antibacterial by sunlight than even a, a, a dryer. Open vessels near a dead body regarded as unclean, and if made of clay that is porous, were to be smashed. All of this avoids the building up of culture media for microorganisms. But how would they know that in BC times when we have only discovered that in the 20th century? This may seem like common sense ideas until you reckon with medical history concerning disease prevention. All would be your actual nurses, doctors should know about the Hungarian physician Ignat Semmelweis of the 1840s in Vienna. In the maternity wards of the celebrated hospital Allegomina Krankenhaus, one out of every six women died, common stats around the world at the time. Dead women were wheeled into autopsy rooms examined by physicians and med students who wore no gloves. Gloves were not yet invented. Afterward, without, without washing their hands, they proceeded to the maternity wards to do pelvic examinations of the living maternity patients. Semmelweis made the connection between the women who became ill and died and the team doing the autopsies and instituted hand washing. As the practice caught on, one out of every 42 died. This is better stats now then one out of every 84, even better. Then one day, after performing autopsies and washing their hands, the physicians and students entered the maternity ward and examined 12 women. 11 of them developed high temperatures and died. Semmelweis surmised that something mysterious and deadly was being carried from live patient to live patient, and he demanded hand washing after each patient was examined, dead or alive. Howls of protest resulted, despite the decrease in mortality rates. Semmelweis was eventually fired for the nuisance he became by demanding hand washing, and his successor dispensed with the practice of hand washing. The dismal dead stats went up again, but nobody made the connection. Meanwhile, Semmelweis could not get a job and so went back to Budapest in Hungary, to a maternity hospital with high mortality rates, and repeated history, including getting fired again. To cut a long story short, he died in a mental institution, a broken and rejected man. Almost 4,000 years before Semmelweis, God gave similar instructions to Moses concerning the necessity of washing after handling the dead or the infected living. But is all of this really divinely suggestive or revealed by God to Moses as Moses claims? Or are there other plausible and natural explanations for these admittedly surprising phenomena in ancient pre-scientific Jewish culture. There are at least three possibilities apart from the God hypothesis. One, Moses, who grew up and was educated in Egypt to the highest level, no doubt, as a son of the palace, simply copied these disease control practices from Egypt. On my usual scale of possible, probable, likely, certain, this suggestion is at least possible. But is it probable? Consider this, the available medical literature of Egypt, especially the papyrus Ebers, very famous 
um, Egyptian medical literature, written about 1552 BC, recommend such remedies for diseases as lizard blood, lizard's blood, swine's teeth, putrid meat, that's rotten meat, excreta from animals, including human beings, donkeys, antelopes, dogs, cats, and even flies. Nothing resembling the mosaic prescriptions concerning disease control appear in the available Egyptian texts. Second option, apart from the God hypothesis. Well, Moses got the knowledge from some other culture. This is possible, but the medical records of no other ancient Near Eastern culture predating or contemporary with Moses reflects anything like what is found in the mosaic texts concerning disease control. Excuse me a bit. Final option, <clears throat> excuse me, final option apart from the God hypothesis. Three, Moses originated the disease control practices. This is not even barely possible, since he would have had to know something about the germ theory of disease minus the knowledge of germs. He would also have needed to know something about the nutritional requirements of infectious microorganisms to know that open clay pots with food particles could maintain such organisms. He would also have needed to know about food chains to know that pathogens can be carried in that manner for him to know which animals should be regarded as clean or unclean. The evidence points toward a divine source behind the mosaic documents. We come now to another major issue, not just prescience concerning health practices, but circumcision, its value and timing, Genesis 17, 9 to 14. I'm assuming that you all know this idea of the required eighth day circumcision for male, male children in Israel. Here's a quotation now from William Kearney, a doctor, quote, under the foreskin is an excellent incubation spot for many bacteria and certain ones in particular. For instance, Mycobacterium smegmatis grows there prolifically. This organism as well as others produces carcinogenic byproducts, cancer producing byproducts. The region under the foreskin is one that can easily be missed in washing and bathing. Scrupulous personal hygiene is necessary to ensure that the area stays clean. Without knowledge of the potential problems associated with not washing under the foreskin, there would be little incentive for such hygiene. During intercourse, without a condom, BC times, these multiplied organisms would be deposited on the cervix, where they would easily grow, produce their byproducts, and cause cancer, especially in women who had any sort of genital irritation from infection, disease, or recent childbirth." End quote. Timing of circumcision. We all know this, the eighth day after birth. Infants have an especially great tendency to bleed between days two and five after birth. Researchers note the cruciality of vitamin K and prothrombin in the blood clotting process. Prothrombin converted to thrombin, which converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which forms the actual clot mesh. Now, these are not things known to me instinctively. I had to do research on this. So I'm repeating for you what my research has revealed. Vitamin K, an important blood clotting element is not present in the infant until between days five and seven. Thus the first safe day for circumcision is day eight. But prothrombin is also necessary for blood clotting. Whole Pediatrics advises that on the third day, the infant's available prothrombin is only 30% of normal. By the eighth day, prothrombin skyrockets to 110% of normal then levels to 100% thereafter. Thus, the first safe day for circumcision is day eight. The evidence points toward a divine source behind the timed practice of circumcision in the mosaic documents. Mind you, given modern medical advances in the 21st century, I gather babies can be safely circumcised at birth. But here's a quotation from an online medical source. Quote, circumcision might not be an option if certain blood clotting disorders are present. Also, circumcision might not be appropriate for premature babies who still require medical care in the hospital nursery or for babies born with abnormalities of the penis. And this is taken, you'll see it, you have seen it in your handout, taken from the prestigious 
Mayo Clinic. I accessed this the 25th of May. Let's look now at chronology. One embarrassing reality concerning the ancient world is lack of confidence about the dating of some events way back then. Whereas we have all the fragments of the writings of some of the most celebrated chroniclers quoted by later writers, in the Bible, we have complete book manuscripts with a strange fussiness about chronology. Some of the celebrated chroniclers usually mentioned by modern scholars are Berossus of Babylon, 4th century BC, Manitho, a learned Egyptian priest, 3rd century BC, Ptolemy, another erudite Egyptian and astronomy, 2nd century of this era. Here's a quotation now from Philip Morrow, worthy of pondering seriously, quote, for the first 2000 years of the history of the human race, from Adam to Abraham, there exists a record of an unbroken line of descent and of one only, in which line the chronology is accurately preserved and safeguarded from error by the simple expedient of giving the father's age in each generation when that particular son was born through whom the line was to be continued. The father's age at the birth of others of his sons being never given. And it was not the oldest son that was chosen in any instance. That would have been the norm in natural circumstances. First son gets a lion's share of mention and the lion's share of any legacy that the father dies and leaves behind. For Seth was not the oldest son of Adam, nor Shem of Noah, nor Abram of Terah, nor Isaac of Abraham, nor Jacob of Isaac, nor Judah of Jacob, nor David of Jesse. The purpose of God in all this comes not into view until the Bible is completed by the addition of the New Testament scriptures, in the light of which, particularly of the genealogical tables of Matthew 1 and Luke 3, that purpose may be clearly seen, end quote. And this is a book I recommend by Philip Morrow, The Wonders of Bible Chronology. He was an, a lawyer and a devout Christian teacher in the early part of the 20th century. And you see the reference if you want to procure a copy. Then there is the Bible's bold link with secular chronology where it can be falsified. Like in Jeremiah 25, one in the statement, quote, the fourth year of Jehoiakim, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, end quote. And in Luke 3, one, quote, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, end quote. Unless there is an omniscient source behind the fussiness about chronology, this is literary recklessness of the highest order. There may be a typographical error in your handout at literary, but um, just check that and correct it for me. Why are you making these specific declarations? which you could be falsified on, unless God is behind your writing. So the writers are running the risk of being falsified because they are not talking of themselves or by themselves. By the, they are being led to write what they wrote by the Holy Spirit who is omniscient and cannot blunder. Then prophecy, I'll just begin this and i leave you because we have done a series on this. Those who have not been in the series way back, they can request the details of the handouts I gave several months back. But here are some markers about prophecy. I'll illustrate the Bible's more than human reliability through our Lord's devastating prophecy about the temple's destruction in Matthew 24. A preliminary word of clarification is necessary. Concerning prophetic accuracy, the biblical yardstick is 100% every time. You can't make a mistake and claim that you're a prophet of God. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 affirms that. By prophecy, we are talking about that which is characterized by three basic criteria, according to apologist and professor of physics at Biola University, Dr. John Bloom. He says clarity is necessary so that failure or fulfillment can be recognized unlike the vagueness of the Delphic Oracle in ancient Greece or some psychics and posters uh, today. They give you some vague prophecies uh, so that when, if they fail, they can hide under the vagueness. I did not say specifically the particular party was going to win the elections, nor did I say 
in particular, how, by what margin of victory the win, winning party would win. So they hedge their bets by being vague. It also should be uh, marked by a prior announcement. The forecast is made before the alleged fulfillment, unlike the Book of Mormon, which prophesies about the new world. But the earliest document we have of the Book of Mormon is um, way after the new world was discovered. And it also has to be marked by independence so that the fulfillment is not influenced by the prophetess or prophet or that one's followers. Let me just go over this and then I'll open for your questions and your comments. Matthew 24, the devastating prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple primarily and of Jerusalem secondarily. So I say we need to clarify the context and text of our Lord's dramatic prophecy in Matthew 24, 2, Mark 13, 2, Luke 21, 6. All three gospel writers record this Olivet discourse. The context, admiration of the buildings of the temple by the disciples. And by buildings, we mean that there was a main temple, but there were auxiliary buildings which would keep the clothing of the priests and so on, and would store articles for cleansing and other articles that the priests would use in the temple. So the admiration of the, the buildings of the temple was in focus, quote, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, end quote, Matthew 24, 1, Mark 13, 1, Luke 21, 5. The text says, quote, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down, end quote. Matthew 24, 2, Mark 13, 2, Luke 21, 6. The meaning of the prophecy is simple. The buildings of the temple would be destroyed. We need to clarify the questions as well put to Jesus by his disciples. One, when will these things be, Lord, equal to when will the buildings of the temple be destroyed? Matthew 24, 3, Mark 13, 4, Luke 21, 7. Second question, what will be the sign that these things are about to be fulfilled? In other words, give us a cue sign that we can know that the destruction of a temple is imminent, very near. What will be the sign that the buildings of the temple are about to be destroyed? Mark 13, 4, Luke 21, 7. And then finally, what will be the sign of your coming and or even of the end of the age? Uniquely in Matthew 24, 3. Matthew's unique question is understandable from a Jew. The thinking would be, if God's temple is to be destroyed, then at the same time, the world must be coming to an end in the return of Jesus Christ. Summary of critical issues in the text. The primary concern, not the second coming, please note, the destruction of the temple. Secondary concern, a sign concerning the destruction of a temple. And the tertiary concern, a sign concerning the second coming of Jesus or the end of the age. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives when he made this prophecy about AD 30. The temple was destroyed 40 years later in the summer of AD 70. And the uncanny details of fulfillment are provided by the non-Christian Jewish historian Josephus, who was an eyewitness of the war between the Jews and the Romans from AD 66 to 70 and a few years beyond. So the temple was destroyed in AD 70, but the skirmish between the Jews and the Romans continued until they cleared out every Jew out of Jerusalem by AD 73. All right, I'm going to stop there. Open for your questions, your comments on precious maybe and chronology. Since we are all of you or most of you would have been familiar with the Matthew 24 uh, treatment that we did quite a few months ago. So any question, any comment, any observation, why the Bible can be trusted is reliable. No ancient document compares in terms of number of manuscripts, in terms of time lapse between original to the earliest copy. And at the end of the handout, I provide you with some comparative statistics, a quotation from uh, a book written, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell and also an excerpt from Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ. Look at those detailed markings there near the end. Question, comment, observation, anybody?
while you're thinking, let me just mention that you may have heard about some people talking about the Bible is not as old as it appears to be because the allegation is that some overzealous monks doctored the Bible, changed the Bible to make it appear as if it's older than it really is. I want to just play a video clip for you now from Bodhi Barkham. We might have done this some time back, but find him on YouTube and look at the whole video. Just watch his dress. There are several versions of it. Look at his dressing jacket and tie and then find that one and listen to it in your own time. So let me try to now bring this up and I hope you will hear it well. So that it would look like we have older documents than we actually have. Let me, let me and in fact, and I think they're really telling me something when they tell this. You know, we don't have any of the originals. <gasps> Like, I'm supposed to shake in my boots when they tell me that. Listen to me. If overzealous monks want to change the Bible, can I explain to you what they would have had to do? Three levels of conspiracy. Level number one, they would have had to have a manuscript conspiracy. When we're talking about just the New Testament itself, there are over 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts for the New Testament itself. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you, but can I compare it to a couple of things? Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. That's how we know about Julius Caesar and his conquest. We have around 10 manuscripts. Aristotle's Poetics. We have nearly five manuscripts. When it comes to the writings of Herodotus, we have less than 10 manuscripts. When it comes to the writings of Homer, less than 10 of each of his writings. When it comes to the New Testament, we have 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts for the New Testament. Folks, that's not even close. Well, you don't have the originals. No, we really don't. But guess what? We can get earlier than AD 120 with some of the copies that we have. When it comes to Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, the earliest thing we can put our hands on was written 900 years after the original. But nobody's tearing down the walls in college because they're reading Caesar. When it comes to Aristotle, the earliest thing we can put our hands on was written 1,400 years after the original. But when it comes to the New Testament, we can put our hands on documents that were written within decades of the originals. So if these overzealous monks wanted to doctor the Bible, what they would have to do is find over 6,000 manuscripts, change all of them, not show their ink work, get them all back where they stole them from, and never tell anybody what they did. That's just level number one. Here's level number two. Jesus said, go and make disciples of ta ethne, every people group. It's funny thing about people groups, they tend to speak different languages. So within the first few centuries, we have the Bible translated into Syriac, Coptic, and Latin. So now these overzealous monks have to find 6,000 Greek manuscripts, change those, doctor them up, don't show your ink work, get them back, go find all the Syriac, Coptic, and Latin translations of those Greek manuscripts, change those to match the lies that you told in another language, and get those back where you stole them from. And that's just level number two. Now you got level number three. The early church fathers had this terrible habit of writing commentary on the New Testament. So much so that Bruce Metzger argues, if all we had of the New Testament was the quotations and citations by the early church fathers, we could reproduce over 95% of the New Testament just from their writings. So now these overzealous monks have to find 6,000 manuscripts and portions of manuscripts, steal them, change them, don't show your ink work, get it back without anybody finding out. They got to find Syriac, Coptic, and Latin translations, change those to match the lies that they told in the 6,000 manuscripts, get those back where they stole them from, and then find all of the writings of all of the early church fathers, change those to match the lies that they told two layers ago, get those put back, never tell anybody what they did, and never ever get caught. Help you if you believe that. Okay, so I would encourage you strongly to find Vodi Balkam, V-O-D-D-I-E-B-A-U-C-H-A-M on YouTube, Why I Choose to Believe the Bible. Look for the one with him dressed up like you just saw him there. 
that is the one that I would recommend. There are several versions. All right, any question, comment, or observation, anybody? Anybody? Boy, we couldn't argue too much because we don't have all of those manuscripts. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I never read them. A very few <laughs> people have, but they're available <laughs> in various universities across the world. I, I, I guess, though, I, I mean, um, that, that seemed human, uh, necessarily human kind of behavior uh, of trying to discredit the Bible mm -hmm. by saying some of the things they, they say without evidence uh, or using their evidence that they have produced and, and, and documented in, in a way to you know, bear out what they, they're thinking on the whole mm -hmm. matter. And the truth is they have not given serious thought to objections to the allegations. Mm -hmm. So when they, they parrot that in high school, more, more likely in college and in high school or university, then people who are unaware would just swallow it and say, yeah, I thought the Bible was defective and you know, not as old as it is. Until you meet somebody who knows more than those professors, more mm -hmm. than those lecturers. And so a Vodibarkam now, who is very qualified, and by the way, he has left America. He's now living and ministering in Zambia. That's where our Garnet Roper from Jamaica is also ministering. Mm. He's at a, a, a United Church University in Zambia. Mm. Bright, a vote is bright like morning star. Yeah, and we can see that. He goes on the university campuses and he presents, you know, and challenges the, the so-called brightest on the campus who are atheists and skeptics and challenge him, you know, dialogue in their own classroom setting. Mm. They don't ban him yet. Well, no, he has voluntarily left America to minister in Africa. He was pastoring a church in Texas, I think, or one of those places. Mm -hmm. That's uh, quite a good number of children too. I think he's, he has probably about nine children. Oh, wow. Yeah, for a young man, that's quite mm -hmm. a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> He <laughs> can, can train them up and let them loose. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the idea I think he would have. <laughs> One thing I like how, uh, like when you bring up the uh, prescience, prescience, uh, prescience, a prescience, yeah, prescience, um, it is, and it always, it always sticks with me is the, the clay pots. Right, right. You know, um, around the dead bodies and the throw them away where, you know, we wouldn't think much of that because, you know, we don't deal with clay pots now, but yeah. at least as far as, you know, for water or for food storage. But, you know, mm. it, it just, you're looking at it, it makes so much sense that, yeah. you know, it's porous. You, 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 you can't get all of the flour, oil, meat, whatever out of that oh, pot. It, but how you wash it. And interesting, you know, you know no Damien has mentioned that. The text goes on to say, if it is made of wood or metal, you can wash it and reuse it. Mm -hmm. But with the clay pots, crash it, crash, crash it up. Right. And just, mm -hmm. just it, you know, you, you think, oh, you know, great grandma passed away in the night, you know, and she died near the clay pots. No, you have to throw away all those clay pots yeah, according, right. to, according to the scripture. You know, and and I, you know, unlike I guess us, I'm sure there are people who questioned it, but they would oh, just yeah. do it. That's right. They would just you, do it. You take it by faith that Moses is speaking for God and he's getting instruction from God. Uh, so you disobey at your own peril. Right. Mm -hmm. You just went on and they did it. You know, fascinating and they, hand washing, especially in a time of COVID. Yeah, yeah. And sanitizer. About yeah. Sanitizing your hand. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and this, this washing of the hands was one yeah. of the key things, you know, mm -hmm. and not just washing it, but washing it with hot water or, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and like you said, you know, it always has to, you know, we were talking about the, you know, creation versus evolution and that kind of stuff, and it has to be, you know, uh, what I call intelligent, intelligent design and... and right. There, there's no way they, like I said, there's no way they could have, have, have known that at all. Mm -hmm. 
because you can look at your hand and your hand looks clean, but yeah, you know, there's millions micro of micro things are there on your uh, billions, even maybe more on crawling yeah. all over your hands that can cause damage if you, you know, like, like look at the COVID. You could be fine. You touch something, you rub your nose, and that's it. Yeah, you know, and oh. and, and 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 you catch it. So really fascinating, yeah, yeah. And then you know, for us, it just makes sense. And all of those things, when God commanded them not to do so and so, not to use so and so, and all of those things, I, I mean, it, it, it was just something he was just throwing out, but he was educating them as to how they yeah, would survive. Protecting their lives. There's a yes, passage right. that says, none of these diseases that you find in Egypt will be upon you. If you do these things that I'm commanding you to do and abstain from the things that I command you to abstain from, you will not be plagued with the diseases that are popular in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how, how, how much information we can gather from the word of God if we, if we just kind of like stick to it uh, yeah. and exercise the, 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 the faith that is necessary. And, and of course, to do the research to see, you know, that it is valid and, and, and stuff like that. But I mean, the, all those bright guys are not going to do that because it's going to mash up the whole of their series. Yeah, and they, they don't have the time. They said they'll be wasting time. Yeah. And um, going through some of those books, like the, I, my quiet time right now is in Leviticus. It's not the easiest book to read, you know, but you trust the, the people who have done the background studies. You're not making much sense of it on your own. You resort to these books and they help to clarify some things. I mean, mm -hmm. the issue... The issue of um, being vulnerable to a piece of literature. Cyrus is mentioned in the Bible hundreds of years before the man was born. Mm -hmm. The Bible prophesied about this fellow coming, Cyrus, who's going to come and he's going to be assisting the people of God in their liberation, the re rebuilding of the temple. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of years before the man was born. Mm -hmm. Can't be buck up, can't be accident, mm -hmm. can't be happenstance. There mm -hmm. has to be omniscience behind the document. Yeah, somebody who knew it would falter. That's right. I remember when I was when I was younger, and I may have said this before. I remember hearing, you know, some people arguing that, you know, Shakespeare had a hand in writing the Bible. You know? <laughs> and and you know, my never thing, heard that one. <laughs> yeah. And my thing is, I mean, there's so much, just even if just in a regular novel, even a crime mystery novel or whatever so much you have to keep track of mm -hmm. from yeah. beginning middle and and to get to the end yeah. without without making a mistake or throwing people off or just be completely going off on a tangent yeah and i mean the bible is 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 what i would is say ten thousand times more i would say complicated more intricate than that yeah and it's just ignorance i mean shakespeare is like so late in yeah. terms of the Bible, Old Testament, worse, and even New Testament, you yeah. know, first century AD. Shakespeare is much later yeah. AD. They, they, what they're probably confusing, and they should have been more sensible in their accusation, is the language of the 17th century translation right. would look like what you would find in a Shakespeare. Right. But right. it doesn't follow that Shakespeare had anything at all to do with the Bible. Right. It's too late. Yep. But just, just, just in keeping everything together, just, mm -hmm. just, you know, being able to go back and study and then be able to link this with this and link this with this. And you know, like you were saying, the, the, the accuracy of the, the prophecies and things in the right. Bible, it's a lot to, to keep track of. That's right. A lot, for, especially for one person. Mm -hmm. So, you know. I just want our young people, especially in the high school and the colleges and universities, to recognize the Bible is not an embarrassment to you intellectually. It can be defended intellectually before any Mr. Body, any Miss Body, no matter how many PhDs they have. People of comparable qualifications have studied the Bible, criticized it, and have come around to saying, yes, this is defensible. But then... They, they wouldn't do anything like that because, you know, as far as they are concerned, they, 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 they are working to, to carry on the, 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 the falseness of their thing. They, yeah. they, don't want, they, they don't want anybody to kind of study it and come up with any, any real 
evidence that that would um, counter counter their argument. And if they, if they were <laughs> genuinely intellectual in their approach, they would open their students to opposing okay. views. In fact, one of the leading um, biological scientists was challenged in a, in a lecture by a Christian student who told him about a book written by a Christian scientist who had a different view about um, how life came to be. And he says, all right, bring me the book. And during the summer, I will just um, knock it to pieces. And he came back after that summer and he says, I could not find any defense of the guy's arguments against my position on life coming from non-living matter. And he had, mm -hmm. out of that, he changed his views as a biological lecturer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, he's on YouTube saying that, they, you know, how he changed his view. He's now a, an intelligent design specialist because of a student challenging him in the lecture theater, which is rare mm -hmm. that a student would challenge and rare that the lecturer will be honest and intellectual enough to examine accusations against his own scientific work. Did he become a believer? I think he's a believer, yeah. He definitely is a believer now. Started by um, becoming an intelligent design defender. I think he's a believer now. I, I, I'm trying to recall his name. I have him in my, in my files. The name just jumped out of me. Dean Kenyon. D-E-A-N-K-E-N-Y-O-N. -E -E he's on YouTube. The, mm -hmm. I think it's captioned, um, biologist changes his view on evolution. He wrote a book, the leading book at the time with a fellow called Gary Steinman, defending biochemical evolution, that life can come forward from non-living things. And he had to renounce his own work after mm -hmm. he read that um, Christian scientist who had three PhDs in the various fields and knocked his views to pieces. I, I, I don't understand why apologetics wouldn't be a, a number one subject on, on the, the theological institutions. Curriculum, my, my puzzle as well, Pastor, my puzzle. Because that, 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 is so, that is so important to, you know, educate the, 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 the pastors coming out in order to argue. I mean, you know. And so that they can educate the youngsters in classrooms, in, our, yeah. in churches, or in yeah. high school. We're losing them because we have not prepared them how to defend the faith, even at the basic Precisely. level. And so they're sitting ducks in high school and worse in college and university. That is why, <laughs> that is why, that, that is why we have lost so many of them, because when they go to university, they don't, they don't come back. That's right. They have not been prepared for the onslaught that they were going to face. That's so we right. don't want youngsters at this service. That's right. Mm. But that my, my, my own the consolation is the fact that God is still in control and there's Bottom nothing line. that is getting out of hand that, that he doesn't know uh, mm. how to correct it and when Not to. It. Nothing that is happening has taken him by surprise. Mm. Although the wrong seems also strong, God mm -hmm. is not ruler yet. Yes. Yes. And I, and I think there's going to be a, a, an awakening before he comes back because oh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, if not, there will be a lot of people who, the hell is going to have more people than hell. Overpopulated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Mm. And I, it's a pity, it's a pity we, we don't have a a, a Christian station that concentrate more on 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 you know the, the whole this whole matter of of um getting arousing the 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 the, the um you know the population and and getting them to to think and reason because sometimes that is how you know things get out somebody just catching on to something that that um, they never thought about and all of a sudden something seemed to be you know real uh, yeah. and, and get committed to it and and dedicated to it that their whole life is yeah. given to to that kind of a situation and the embarrassment about the plurality of christian stations both here in america and especially in the caribbean region is that most of them are just interested in playing music 
Yeah. Idea of defending the faith on radio, helping youngsters who are struggling with questions, intellectual questions, to have a response. They're not interested in that. I have yeah. made suggestions to them. You send them things, and you say you could have a double watch like uh, Love FM, and it just passes by them. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah, you're right. This is and and this is kind of the part of my problem too. That I mean, y you know, we're putting on a, a, a nice show. Uh, I mean, a musical presentation in 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 all of our service instead of getting into the, the you know. We're not even singing hymns anymore, almost. Uh, and 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 there are hymns that have real truth in them that, that we Solid still need. Content, to... Biblically grounded content, yeah. Yeah. We Christians just have to take their brains a little bit more seriously rather than, you know, God has given you a brain, but you don't use it. I've mm -hmm. never forgotten a lady at um, in my second pastorate. I do a, did a study one Sunday morning and she said, said to me, a lady with a first degree from UWI. And she came to me after the service and said, Rev, you know, to be honest with you, when I come to church on a Sunday, I want mean, to hot up my brain. <laughs> 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 I felt so insulted for her and UWI that she has a degree from UWI and talking that kind of foolishness. Oh, God give me a brain to think. Somebody says, um, ask him, um, it was Howard Hendrix, he said he, he asked a brain specialist in his church. He says, um, whatever the guy's name was. So have you seen a, a brain overused? And the, 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 the brain surgeon says, I've not even seen one slightly used. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a brain, but we're not really using it. Jesus yeah. was a thinker, a logician, but we, we don't see him as the, one of the wisest persons who has ever walked on the planet. We just think about him as loved of it, Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, miracle worker. But he used his brain and he challenged the scribes and the Pharisees on logical points. We need to just take the Bible much more seriously in that regard. Mm -hmm. I just recommend it to Damien for the brilliant students who got full scholarship and the lady who, who's a, no, a medical doctor. Love Your God With All Your Mind by J.P. Moreland, one of my favorite lecturers at Bible University and also in France. Fundamental book. That I tell students, I say, sell your bed and buy this book. And what he does, interesting, at the end of the book, he gives you recommended literature for the various disciplines at the university level. Whether you're studying medicine or architecture or economics, he recommends books written by Christians that are akin to your discipline to help you to be still think and think godly thoughts and not be embarrassed about your Bible. Who was the author for that one again? Love your God above your mind. J.P. Moreland, M-O-R-E-L-A-N-D is his surname. -E one of the cleanest minds I've studied under, including guys I met at um, UTC and JTS. Just a very tidy philosophical mind. The guy, the guy who was with you last week, um, that trip that you, you did, was that last week? It was, oh, you mean was... Ian Boyne? With the existence of God, yeah. That, that was Ian? Yeah, Ian Boyne, yeah. Okay. Yeah, really just hard talk. They have not found a replacement for him since his death. Oh, man. So they would repeat episodes, but nobody has replaced him. Um, Faye Ellington replaced him on, on profile, but they have not replaced Ian in terms of religious really hard talk. Hmm. When was that that you did that to him? That was um, oh, 20, hold on, I was in Jamaica at the time. So it was, it, yeah. probably the band of 2011 to 2013. Yeah. Oh, and then he, when did he die? Ian died about 2018. Because I know I was at Sligoville then. His wife asked me to pay a tribute to him at the funeral. So I finished church and got a ride down to the funeral. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, the, the, the doctor you're talking about, the, the, the young lady, is um, Brother Earl's daughter, you know? Yeah. Oh, the, 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 the one who is now a medical doctor is Brother Earl's daughter? Yeah. Yes. Multiple congrats, multiple congrats. Yeah, man. And, 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 and the, 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 the mother, the two of them, man. She had, she got, she got highest honors. Oh yeah, 
Yep. She did very, very well. I think she got well. straight, straight A's all the way through. They would call those golden, golden students. Yeah. From day one, some of those people just A. They don't have no other letter there. In their head. <laughs> just A. They, they never go farther down the alphabet. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no need. Stop. But you know, one of my friends who I studied with is now a clinical psychologist at Walter Reed. He had a little mischievous thing. He says, Chisholm, in the American system, you know, they have the, the, the awards, um, cum laude with praise, mm. magna cum laude with great praise, summa cum laude with extremely great praise or with highest honors. He says, some people graduate, Lord, how come? That's <laughs> 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 my, my friend, man. Uh, <laughs> and and the, the other guy you were with is the one up where you are there, right? Paul Lawson. Uh, okay, yeah, he, 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 he's he was a pastor. trained in Jamaica too. Oh yeah, he's Jamaican, trained at J JTS, and then went on to specialize in education as a PhD in education. Okay, yeah, man, dear dear friend, we grew up together. In the assemblies of God in Montego Bay Faith Temple. Mm. All right. Mm. Any more questions, observations, comments? Well, I think we got we got more than we can digest for one night, boy. What I'm going to do for the next for the, the remaining Wednesdays in this month is to look at the abortion debate. I'm going to do a Good. primer a primer on it since. It's going to be in the air for quite a while yet until the Supreme Court rules on whether it's going to be Roe v. Wade will be, remain or it will go. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a Bible study that I did at Metropolitan years ago on the abortion thing and then provide some different arguments, the own, the own body argument, the not a person argument, and so on. We're going to go through all of those to help Christians if they want to participate in the public square in the debate, they will have some foundational material to draw on. Mm -hmm. Good idea. So I'll send the first Bible study thing to Natalie tomorrow to be distributed for next week, Wednesday, God willing. Oh, so that is next week we're going to start that? The next week we start that, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Reverend, let's give you a mind closing us in a word of prayer. And thank you very much, Reverend Chisholm, always for your, your, your time and your knowledge. My joy and honor, my brother. And, and your inspiration, boy. Woe be unto me if I do not teach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Even if it's a small group like doesn't us. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, right. For two or three. Mm -hmm. Let, let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you. Thank you for the way in which you have prepared a way so that even after thousands of years, we can still receive your word as it was given and uh, can, be, can learn what we need to in order for us to live lives that are healthy, and wholesome. And it is just such a pity that so many people disregard your truth and do their own thing, seeking to corrupt the minds of young and old in order to bring them into their camp. But Father, we know that you're not fighting with them. They are fighting with you, but you are the Almighty. And you know all that we don't know and what is going to happen from beginning to end. And so we ask that, Lord, as some of us are striving to awaken ourselves to some of these deep issues that should help us to accept and to follow your word, that you would renew our minds and uh, sensitize us with the, 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 that, that hunger and that thirst to get for ourselves the truth so that we can help others who come along our pathway. Thank you for our brother and for what you have given him and allowed him to use to your glory. May you strengthen him in all the ways that are possible so that he might continue to do the work that you have committed to him. Hear our prayers 
and grant us the desire and the determination to know more about you so that we are able to be the salt and the light in this world in which we find ourselves. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Night, All right, night, 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 night everyone. All right. Take care of our claims. <laughs>